Altogether, Lim had about 40 so-called holy wives. He frightened them so much and made them believe he had supernatural powers so that they would have sex with him. The Toa Payo ritual murders took place in Singapore in 1981. On the 25th of January, the body of a nine-year-old girl was found dumped next to the lift of a block of apartments in the Toa Payo district, and two weeks later, a nine-year-old boy was found dead nearby. The children's lives had been taken purportedly as blood sacrifices to the Hindu goddess Kali. The murders were masterminded by Adrian Lim, a self-styled medium who had tricked scores of women into believing he had supernatural powers. In other words, he was a dirty bastard. His victims offered money and sexual services in exchange for cures, beauty and good fortune. Two of these women became his loyal assistants. Tan Mui Chu married him and Ho Ka Hong became one of his holy wives. But before I get into the story, let's have a look at the beginnings of Adrian Lim. Early in the 19th century, immigrants flooded into peninsular Malaysia, colonizing the straight settlements including the island city of Singapore. Migrants and natives held differing beliefs, but over time, the boundaries between those belief systems blurred. Most of the population believed in spirits that inhabit the jungles and in gods and devils that hover around capable of benevolence and mischief. Certain people claimed that they could communicate with the supernatural. Through rituals in which they danced and chanted, these spirit mediums, Tang Keys and Bomos they were called, invited the beings to possess their bodies and dole out wisdoms, blessings and curses to their believers. As time passed and the cities grew, the jungles gave way to concrete structures and the medium's practices moved deeper into the heartland of communities. By 1980, 75% of the Singapore public were living in public housing. The government built high-rising blocks of apartments clustered in the population centres, of which the Toa Peo district was typical. Now born on the 6th of January 1942, Adrian Lim was the eldest son of a middle class family. Described at the trial by his sister as a hot tempered boy, he dropped out of secondary school and worked a short stint as an informant for the Eternal Security Department. He then joined the radio company Red Diffusion in 1962. For three years, he installed and serviced Red Diffusion sets as an electrician before being promoted to Bill collector. In April 1967, Lim married his childhood sweetheart with whom he had two children. Lim converted to Catholicism for his marriage. Lim then started part-time practice as a spirit medium in 1973. He rented a room where he attended to the women, most of whom were bar girls, dance hostesses and prostitutes, introduced to him by his landlord. Lim's customers also included superstitious men and elderly females whom he cheated only of cash. He had learned the trade from a bamo called Uncle Willie and prayed to gods of various religions despite his Catholic baptism. The Indian goddess Kali and Fragan, which Lim described as a Siamese sex god, were among the spiritual entities he called on his rituals. Lim deceived his clients with several confidence tricks. His most effective gimmick, known as the needles and egg trick, 
sounds like a faux menu item, duped many to believe that he had supernatural abilities. Unaware that the egg had been tampered with, the client would be convinced by the sight of the black needles that even spirits were harassing her. Lim particularly preyed on gullible girls who had deep personal problems. He promised them that he could solve their woes and increase their beauty through a ritual massage. As I said earlier, dirty bastard. After Lim and his client had stripped, he would knead her body, including her genitals, with Frajan's idol and have sex with her. Lim's treatments also included an electroshock therapy based on that used on mental patients. After placing his client's feet in a tub of water and attaching wires to her temples, Lim passed electricity through her. The shocks, he assured her, would cure headaches and drive away evil spirits. We now move on to Catherine Tan Mui Chu. She was referred to Lim by a fellow Bargel, who claimed the spirit medium could cure ailments and depression. Tan, at the time, was grieving the death of her grandmother to whom she had been devoted. And this is a constant theme with those who are easily fooled by others claiming to be, you know, some kind of spirit god or something. Normally, the disenfranchised or those who are going through a difficult time mentally are the ones who are the most preyed. Furthermore, her estrangement from her parents weighed on her mind. Having been sent away at the age of 13 to a vocational centre, she felt unwanted by them. Tan's visits to Lim became regular and their relationship grew intimate. In 1975, she moved into his apartment on his insistence. To allay his wife's suspicions that he was having an affair with Tan, Lim swore an oath of denial before a picture of Jesus Christ. However, she discovered the truth and moved out with their children a few days later, divorcing Lim in 1976. Lim then quit his job at Red Diffusion and became a spirit medium full time. I mean, imagine if he was around today, maybe he'd be like a medium YouTuber. His TikTok would probably blow up. He enjoyed brisk business at one point receiving between two to three thousand dollars a month from a single client. In June 1977, Lim and Tan registered their marriage. Lim dominated Tan through beatings, threats and lies. He persuaded her to prostitute herself to supplement their income. He also convinced her that he needed to fornicate with young women to stay healthy. Thus, Tan assisted him in his business preparing the clients for his pleasure. You horny devil. Lim's influence over Tan was strong. On his encouragement and promise that sex with a younger man would preserve her youth, Tan copulated with a Malay teenager and even with her younger brother. The boy was not her only sibling to be influenced by Lim. The medium had earlier seduced Tan's younger sister and tricked her into selling her body and having sex with two youths. We now move on to Ho Ka Hong. Born on the 10th of September 1955, Ho Ka Hong, and for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to call her Ho. She was 8 years old when her father died. Again, you're seeing the theme, disenfranchised, going through something difficult. She was then sent to live with her grandmother until she was 15. When she returned to her mother and siblings, she was constantly required to give way to her elder sister, Lei Ho. Under the perception that her mother favoured her sister, Ho became disgruntled, showing her temper easily. In 1979, her mother brought Ho to Lim for treatment and became convinced of Lim's powers by his needles and egg trick. As I said, the faux menu item has its way. Believing that Ho's volatile temper could also be cured by Lim, the old woman brought her younger daughter to the medium. After witnessing the same trick, Ho became Lim's loyal follower. Lim had a desire to make Ho one of his holy wives. Holy shit! Even though she was already married. To achieve his goal, Lim sought to isolate Ho from her family by feeding her lies. He claimed that her family were immoral people who practiced infidelity and that Lo, the husband of Ho, was an unfaithful man who would force her into prostitution. Ho believed Lim's words and after going through a rite with him, 
she was declared by the medium as his only wife. She no longer trusted her husband and family and became violent towards her mother. Three months after she had first met Lim, Ho moved from her house and went to live with him. Lo, the husband of Ho, sought after his wife at Lim's apartment and ended up staying there to observe her treatment. He was persuaded by her to participate in her electroshock therapies. In the early hours of the 7th of January 1980, Lo sat with Ho, their arms are locked together and their feet in separate tubs of water. Lim applied a large voltage to Lo, who was electrocuted while Ho was stunned into unconsciousness. When she awoke, Lo was dead and Lim told her to lie to the police about it. Ho repeated the story Lim had given her, saying that her husband had been electrocuted in their bedroom when he tried to switch on a faulty electric fan in the dark. The coroner recorded an open verdict and the police made no further investigations. Despite her antipathy towards Lo, Ho was affected by his death. Her sanity broke, she started hearing voices and hallucinating seeing her dead husband. At the end of May, she was admitted to the Woodbridge Hospital. The psychologist diagnosed her condition as schizophrenia and started appropriate treatments. Ho made a remarkably quick recovery. By the first week of July, she was discharged. She continued her treatment with the hospital. Follow-up checks showed that she was in a state of remission. Ho's attitude towards her mother and other family members began to improve after her stay in the hospital, but she did continue to live with Lim and Tan. With Ho and Tan as his assistants, Lim continued his trade, tricking more women into giving him money and sex. By the time of his arrest, he had 40 holy wives. In late 1980s, he was arrested and charged with sexual assault. His accuser was Lucy Lau, a door-to-door -door cosmetic sales girl who had met Lim when she was promoting beauty products to Tan. On the 19th of October, Lim told Lau that a ghost was haunting her, but he could exercise it with his sexual rituals. She was unconvinced, but she goes, all right, show me what you got. So Lim secretly mixed two capsules of Dalmadorm, a sedative, into a glass of milk and offered it to her, claiming it had holy properties. Lau became groggy after drinking it, which allowed Lim to take advantage of her. For the next few weeks, he continued to abuse her by using drugs or threatening her. In November, after Lim had given her parents a loan smaller than the amount they had requested, Lau made a police report about his treatment of her. Lim was arrested on charges of sexual assault and Tan for abetting him. Out on bail, Lim persuaded Ho to lie that she was present at the alleged assault but saw no crime committed. The Ho, of course, lied. This failed to stop the police inquiries. Lim and Tan had to extend their bail in person at the police station every fortnight. Frustrated at this, Lim plotted to distract the police with some murders. Moreover, he believed that sacrifices of children to the goddess Kali would persuade her supernaturally to draw the attention of the police away from him. Lim pretended to be possessed by Kali and convinced Tan and Ho that the goddess wanted them to to wreak vengeance on Lao. So in other words, his theory was, well, I'm getting done for this sexual assault case. I know what I'll do. I'll take the lives of some young kids and maybe that'll distract the police. Bro, what? On the 24th of January, 1981, Ho spotted Agnes, a nine-year-old girl at a nearby church and lured her to the apartment. The trio plied her with food and drink that was laced with Dalmadorm. After Agnes became groggy and fell asleep, Lim abused her. Near midnight, the trio smothered Agnes with a pillow and drew her blood, drinking and smearing it on a portrait of Carly. Following that, they drowned the girl by holding down her head in a pail of water. Finally, Lim used his electroshock therapy device to make doubly sure that her life was taken. They stuffed her body in a bag and dumped it near an elevator on a nearby block. Then, 10-year-old Ghazali bin Marzuki suffered a similar fate when he was brought by Ho to the apartment on the 6th of February 1981. He, however, proved resistant to the sedatives, taking a long time to fall asleep. 
Lim decided to tie up the boy as a precaution. However, the boy awoke and struggled. After drawing his blood, they proceeded to drown their victim. Ghazali struggled, vomiting and losing control of his bowels as he died. The boy kept streaming blood from his nose after his death. While Tan stayed behind to clean the apartment, Lim and Ho disposed the body. Lim noticed that a trail of blood led to the apartment, so he and his accomplices cleaned as much as they could of these stains before sunrise. But what they missed led the police to the apartment and they were arrested. On the 7th of February, Ghazali bin Mazuki was found dead under a tree between blocks 10 and 11. He had been missing since the previous day, after being seen boarding a taxi with an unknown woman. Forensic pathologists on the scene deemed the cause of death as drowning and found on the boy suffocation marks. There were no signs of sexual assault, but the boy had burn marks on his back and a puncture in his arm. Traces of a sedative were later detected in his blood. The police found a scattered trail of blood that led to the seventh floor of block 12. Stepping into the common corridor from the stairwell, Inspector Pereira noticed an eclectic mix of religious symbols, such as a cross, a mirror, and a knife blade on the entrance of the first apartment. The owner of the apartment, Adrian Lim, approached the inspector and introduced himself, informing Pereira that he was living there with his wife, Tan Mui Chu, and a girlfriend, Ho Ka Hong. Permitted by Lim to search his apartment, police found traces of blood. Lim initially tried to pass the stains off as candle wax, but when challenged, claimed they were chicken blood. After the police found slips of paper written with the dead children's personal details, Lim tried to allay suspicions by claiming that Ghazali had come to his apartment seeking treatment for a bleeding nose. He discreetly removed some hair that was found under the carpet and tried to flush it down the toilet. But the police stopped him. Forensics later determined the hair to be Agnes's. Requesting a background check on Lim, Pereira received word from local officers that the medium was currently involved in a sexual assault investigation. Lim overheard them and became agitated, raising his voice at the law enforcers. His ire was mimicked by Ho, who started to gesture loudly. Their actions further raised the investigators' suspicions that the trio were deeply involved in the murders. The police collected the evidence sealed the apartment as a crime scene and took Lim and the two women in for questioning. Two days after the arrest, Lim, Tan and Ho were charged in the subordinate court for the murders of the two children. The trio were subjected to further interrogations by the police and to medical examinations by prison doctors. So the court case was convened on the 25th of March 1983. Other evidence, the blood samples, religious objects, drugs and the notes with Agnes and Ghazali's names conclusively proved the defendant's involvement. The prosecution had no eyewitnesses to the murders. The evidence was circumstantial but they told the court in the opening statement that what matters is that the trio did intentionally suffocate and drown these two children, causing their deaths in circumstances which amounted to murder. And this we will prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Ho had to accept the court's offer of counsel receiving a public defender, and since his arrest, Lim wanted to defend himself. He defended himself at the subordinate court hearings, but could not continue to do so when the case was moved to the high court. Singapore law requires that for capital crimes, the accused must be defended by a legal professional. Thus, Howard Cashin was appointed as Lim's lawyer, although his job was complicated by his client's refusal to cooperate. The three lawyers involved for each defendant did not dispute the fact that they murdered the children. Acting on a defense of diminished responsibility, they attempted to show that their clients were not sound of mind and could not be held responsible for the killings. If this defense had been successful, defendants would have escaped the death penalty to face either life imprisonment or up to 10 years in jail. After the defending lawyers had presented the prosecution evidence, the court heard testimonies on the personalities and character flaws of the accused from their relatives and acquaintances. 
details of their lives were revealed by one of Lim's holy wives. Private medical practitioners Dr. Yeo Peng Ji and Dr. Ang Yu Hua, ah yeah, I butchered those names, admitted that they were Lim's sources for drugs and had provided the trio sleeping pills and sedatives without question on each consultation. The police and forensics teams gave their accounts of their investigations. Inspector Supaya, the investigating officer in charge, read out the statements the defendants had made during their remand. In these statements, Lim said he murdered out of revenge and that he sodomized Agnes. The three had also confirmed in their statements that each was an active participant in the murders. There were many contradictions among these statements and the confessions made in court by the accused but Judge Sinathure declared that despite the conflicting evidence, the essential facts of this case are not in dispute. Lim's involvement in the crimes further evidenced by a witness who vouched that just after midnight, on the 7th of February 1981, at the ground floor of Block 12, he saw Lim and a woman walk past him carrying a dark-skinned boy. And on April the 13th, Lim took the stand and he maintained that he was the sole perpetrator of the crimes. Lim was selective in answering the questions the court threw at him. He verbosely answered those that agreed with his stance and refused to comment on the others. When challenged on the veracity of his latest confession, he claimed that he was bound by religious and moral duty to tell the truth. The prosecution, however, countered that Lim was inherently a dishonest man who had no respect for oaths. You see, Lim had lied to his wife, his clients, the police and the psychiatrist. The prosecution claimed Lim's stance in court was an open admission that he willingly lied to his earlier statements. Tan and Ho were more cooperative, answering the questions posed by the court. They denied Lim's story and vouched for the veracity of the statements they had given to the police. They told how they had lived in constant fear and awe of Lim, believing he had supernatural powers they followed his every order and had no free will of their own. That's a nice way of confirming your own stupidity. Under the prosecution's questioning, however, Tan admitted that Lim had been defrauding his customers and that she had knowingly helped him to do so. Now, the psychiatrist's testimony played a big part in this case. No one doubted that Lim, Tan and Ho had killed the children. The defense was based on convincing the judges that medically, the accused were not in total control of themselves during the crimes. The bulk of the trial was therefore a battle between expert witnesses called by both sides. Dr. Wong Yip Chong, a senior psychiatrist in private practice, believed that Lim was mentally ill at the time of the crimes. The psychiatrist said that Lim's ferocious sexual appetite and deluded belief in Kali were characteristics of a mild manic depression or just a dirty bastard. The doctor also said that only an unsound mind would dump the bodies close to his home when his plan was to distract the police. In rebuttal, the prosecution's expert witness, Dr. Chi Kuen Si, a psychiatrist at Woodbridge Hospital, said that Lim was purposeful in his pursuits, patient in his planning, and persuasive in his performance for personal power and pleasure. In Dr. Chi's opinion, Lim had indulged in sex because through his role as a medium, he obtained a supply of women who were willing to go to bed with him. Furthermore, his belief in Kali was religious, not delusional in nature. Lim's use of religion for personal benefit indicated full self-control. Lastly, Lim had consulted doctors and freely taken sedatives to alleviate his insomnia, a condition which, according to Dr. Chi, sufferers from manic depression fail to recognize. Now, further doctors such as Dr. Nangyu Lendron and Dr. Chi, previously mentioned, agreed that Ho suffered from schizophrenia long before she met Lim and that her stay in Woodbridge Hospital had helped her recovery. Remember, there was a time when she came out of hospital, she was actually getting on better with her family. However, while Dr. Nangyu Lendron was convinced that Ho suffered a relapse during the time of these murders, Dr. Chi pointed out that none of the Woodbridge doctors saw any signs of relapse during the six months of her follow checkups between July 1980 and January 1981. Ending his testimony, 
Dr. Chi stated that it was incredible that three people with different mental illnesses should share a common delusion of receiving a request to kill from a god. Now, in their closing speeches in the trial, the defense again emphasized on the mental illnesses of their client. The defense lawyer, Kashin, said that Lim was a normal man until his initiation into the occult and that he was clearly divorced from reality when he entered the unreasonable world of atrociousness, acting on his delusions to take the lives of children in Kali's name. The defense went on to say that due to her depression and Lim's abuse, Tan was just a robot carrying out orders without thought. Regarding Ho, they concluded that she was a schizophrenic mind accepted that if the children were killed, they would go to heaven and not grow up evil like her mother and others. The defense criticized Dr. Chi for failing to see the problems in the defendants. The prosecution started its closing speech by drawing attention to the cool and calculating manner in which the children were killed. The prosecution also argued that the accused could not have shared the same delusion and only brought it up during the trial. The cunning and deliberation displayed in the acts could not have been done by one deluded person. Tan helped Lim because she loved him and Ho was simply misled into helping the crimes. Urging the judges to consider the ramifications of their verdict, the prosecution said, My lords, to say that Lim was less than a coward who preyed on little children because they could not fight back, kill them in the hope that he would gain power or wealth and therefore did not commit murder, is to make no sense of the law of murder. It would lend credence to the shroud of mystery and magic he has conjured up in his practices and by which he managed to frighten, intimidate and persuade the superstitious, the weak and the gullible into participating in the most lewd and obscene acts. Now on the 25th of May 1983, there were huge crowds outside the courthouse waiting for a verdict. Due to limited seating, only a few were allowed inside to hear Justice Sinathure's delivery of the verdict which took 15 minutes. The judges were not convinced by the notion of these people were mentally ill. The judge found Tan to be an awful and wicked person and a willing party to Lim's loathsome and nefarious acts. The judge found Ho to be simple and easily influenced. Although she suffered from schizophrenia, it was noted that she was in a state of remission during the murders, hence she should bear full responsibility for her actions. All three defendants were found guilty and were sentenced to be hanged. The two women did not react to their sentences, but Lim, he beamed, he smiled, he looked up and he said, Oh, thank you, Lord. Lim accepted his fate. The women did not and appealed against their sentences. The appeal judges reaffirmed the decision of their trial counterparts, noting that as finders of facts, judges have the right to discount medical evidence in light of evidence from other sources. In other words, they will call bullshit when they see bullshit. Tan and Ho's further appeals to London's Privy Council and Singapore President Wee Kim Wee met with similar failures. Having exhausted all their avenues for pardon, Tan and Ho calmly faced their fates. While waiting on death row, the trio were counseled by Catholic priests and nuns. In spite of the reputation that surrounded Lim, Father Brian Doro recalled the murderer as a rather friendly person. Taking a bit too far, isn't it, Father? When the day of execution loomed, Lim asked Father Doro for absolution and holy communion. Likewise, Tan and Ho had Sister Gerard Fernandez as their spiritual counsellor. The nun converted the two female convicts to Catholicism and they received forgiveness and holy communion during the final days. On the 25th of November 1988, the three of them were given their last meal and then they were taken to the hangman's noose. Lim smiled throughout his last walk. After the sentences were carried out, the three murderers were given a short Catholic funeral mass by Father Doro and cremated on the same day. Now regarding the story, here's my conclusion. One of the reasons why I believe in God, one of the reasons, is final justice. To me, him being hanged is not enough. We don't know if he's suffering. We don't know where he is right now. Like, it's as if he just escaped and now he's gone. 
You see what I'm saying? I guess in a way, thinking that there is some kind of judgment, justice, punishment when you die. Maybe that's a way where I comfort myself to make myself feel better regarding this story, for example. You know, it might be true, it might not. I'm not trying to give you an argument. I'm trying to say that hanging him, it just feels light. You see, the parents of these two children, where's their court case? Where's their psychiatric help? You see what I mean? But this madman who went to women and said, hey, there's a problem with you, and if you pay me X, Y, and Z, and if we have sex, I can make you feel better. But you could also say, Adrian Lim, how desperate are you? What's missing inside of you? How bad was your life that you're willing to do these to other people, particularly these two children? In some religions, it is said that in hell, your feet will burn and it will be so hot that your brain will boil. Believe it or not, Adrian Lim deserves that fate. Comment, tell me what you think.